gross photograph of a, of a young chick. Uh, the common disease name for coli bacillosis in chicks is mushy chick disease. Uh, it primarily causes an umphalitis. This is the, where the umbilicus attaches. Within this uh, is the uh, yolk sac uh, that's uh, been internalized. Oftentimes, you, when you open that up, uh, you'll find just inside the abdominal wall uh, combinations of fibrin and heterophyll, so it would be a fibrinous peritonitis or a, a serositis. And then uh, the yolk will have a foul smell to it, or uh, it'll have a foul odor. This just shows a, another uh, projection of that same thing. This is more of a uh, cellulitis uh, that uh, you can see injection of the uh, vessels over the abdominal uh, uh, subcutaneous tissue and then uh, fibrin that's right uh, below the skin. Uh, the types, uh, in terms of uh, serotypes of E. coli that cause problems, the most common uh, recovered E. coli of uh, poultry is untypable. There's approximately, uh, they usually uh, classify them in terms of the uh, somatic O antigen. The most common serotypes that uh, are considered pathogenic are O1, O2, O8, and O78. But like I said, the most common type are untypable. Uh, in more mature animals, you'll see a septicemia, uh, a uh, fibrinous uh, pericarditis, a fibrinous perihepatitis. The more correct term is probably, as, as Dr. Porter alluded to earlier, was a fibrinous capsular serositis uh, would be more accurate. And this, uh, if you looked at it uh, just as a cursory view, you wouldn't think there's anything wrong with that liver. But if you see this pale, white uh, material that just barely covers the surface, uh, that's actually fibrin. And fibrin uh, in birds will appear like that. If it's very thin, it'll just be uh, almost white and, and translucent. Uh, if you let it dry out a little bit, it, it, uh, it's better in terms of photography. You can actually see that uh, uh, covering over the surface of the liver. And again, this is a, a perihepatitis. The primary uh, pathogenesis for this exposure is usually respiratory en route. Uh, e. coli is found very commonly in dust of the environments in which chickens live and they inhale that and it becomes septicemic. Most birds that have the, uh, the uh, fibrinous perihepatitis, pericarditis, will also have a fibrinous peritonitis. And again, this is fibrin within uh, and surrounding the mesentery. This is the, um, the cranial thoracic air sac, so there's actually a fibrinous uh, air sacculitis. People ask me, um, it's very difficult to be able to tell air sacculitis from peritonitis. I did uh, some studies where I injected a, a radiographic uh, dye into the uh, respiratory tract, and the abdominal air sacs cover all the organs through here. So sometimes people will call this a uh, air sacculitis, and sometimes it'll be called a peritonitis. What I, what I like to do in terms of uh, defining an air sacculitis is be more pure if I see that thin sheet of an air sac membrane that has fibrin on that, or within a specific cavity, then I'll call it an air sacculitis. If not, then I have a tendency to use the, the term uh, peritonitis. Yes? Jake, I'm sorry, maybe I just missed this. Were you making a distinction between the uh, omphalitis and the peritonitis as far as the respiratory transmission? No, that's, no. Omphalitis is normally uh, from contamination of the, the umbilicus or the yolk, uh, and usually it's uh, contamination of the, of the egg. It's not transoverally transmitted. No, this is a different, this is more on mature um, chickens in terms of, uh, those, they'll generally show a, a, a peritonitis and, and pericarditis. This is a lousy photograph, but it, this is, um, like Dr. Porter says, sometimes you put slides in your uh, talk to be able to remind you to talk about something. Uh, this is to remind me to tell you about chronic respiratory disease of poultry. This is a broiler chicken that's got, again, a fibrinous pericarditis and a fibrinous parahepatitis. Uh, chronic respiratory disease usually uh, has to have a primary trigger. Those are usually viruses or respiratory viruses such as infectious bronchitis, Newcastle disease, or more commonly mycoplasma, mycoplasma galliseptacum uh, is the one uh, that's most commonly associated with that. And I'll show you some uh, photographs of mycoplasma galliseptacum when I uh, talk about respiratory diseases. Another manifestation of E. coli disease in mature chickens uh, is uh, Hajari's disease, that's H-J-A-R-R-E apostrophe S, and those are coli granulomas. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of a coli granuloma. 
and they, they show, uh, they present in terms of granulomas in numerous organs. This is the liver, uh, and then this is our numerous granulomas scattered throughout. Uh, this is the intestine, and you can see some serosal granulomas. I'll show you uh, a, a different uh, projection of the liver. This is the gallbladder here for orientation. These pale white areas are those granulomas. And then uh, this is the intestines removed. Again, the serosa has these pale white masses. If you see that normally, you need to think about two other diseases, mycobacteriosis primarily, uh, and then secondary is Salmonella pylorum will also uh, present in terms of granulomas. This is a uh, photomicrograph of the liver. Uh, this is a typical coli granuloma. This is a central eosinophilic mass of uh, cellular debris. Um, sometimes you can see a gradation from this eosinophilic granular mass to uh, the granular mass with, with uh, small nuclei. And then further out around that rim, you'll see actually intact heterophils. And I think probably what happens is the heterophils, as they uh, group around the, the bacteria, will have a tendency to degranulate. The birds lack, lack the liquefying enzymes of a, of a separative or prelent reaction. And so um, the, the cells have a tendency to be intact and they'll stay there. Uh, but normally you'll see uh, large numbers of uh, multinucleated giant cells that surround that uh, reaction. Uh, and then they'll, they'll more commonly have these clear vacuoles scattered throughout. Uh, this not only happens with E. coli, but it also happens with other bacteria as well. Staphylococcus, as uh, Dr. Porter alluded to earlier. Uh, so anyway, this is uh, what it would look like histologically in the liver, and also you'd see those same types of uh, granulomas on the serosal surface of the intestine. Uh, you'll also see uh, high, or a uh, Hypopion, where you'll see uh, inflammatory infiltrate uh, within the anterior chamber. It'll usually be heterophils and fibrin. Uh, and this is a, another uh, presentation of uh, coli bacillosis or uh, coli septicemia. It's usually not a very common one, but it, it's one that you will see. Okay. So that's uh, coli bacillosis. And that, um, not just... Um, not just chickens will get uh, e. Coli uh, or e. coli bacillosis, but you see that in almost all birds. Uh, more commonly in poultry, it's seen in uh, chickens and in uh, turkeys and in ducks. All right, this is an old photograph because I've never actually seen a case of this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think that car is about a 1950. Uh, looks like a Chrysler to me. The, um, this, is a, and, uh, this is also an old turkey. This is the old style rod-breasted bronze turkeys. They had black feathers. Uh, the industry has since gone away from those types of turkeys because when they had pin feathers, they were black. And people didn't like to see black pin feathers on the carcass of turkeys. So now we have uh, all white turkeys. This is a snood uh, that male turkeys have. The common management is to, to now remove that snood when they're young. As uh, turkeys sexually mature, this will develop. They can inflate that and it'll become very enlarged. And this is part of the pathogenesis of erysipelas or erysipelothix uh, rusiopathy. When birds have sexual maturity, this will be enlarged and birds will peck at that. Uh, this just shows one of those where you can see enlargement of that snood. Uh, the birds will peck at that. They'll cause damage uh, to the uh, skin. The erysipelothrix will uh, enter in there and then will cause a septicemia. You can actually see uh, swelling of the snood and then also a facial cellulitis of turkeys. This uh, shows, again, uh, the, the snood that's affected. You can see hemorrhage and necrosis both on the snood and uh, on the, the uh, dermis of the, of the uh, face. You can also see uh, necrosis in other areas of the skin can see areas of uh, petechial hemorrhage throughout the uh, muscle. And then this is a bad photograph of the spleen where you can see areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. Histologically, the, the way to diagnose this disease is by uh, taking the spleen. You can do impression smears and do a gram stain on that. Uh, you can, the, the classic presentation is arterioles that are filled with bacteria and fibrin within uh, the spleen. That tips you off to erysipelas, or if uh, slaughter workers all of a sudden have problems with uh, erysipelas. 
Other changes are areas of necrosis and uh, hemorrhage within the liver, uh, hemorrhage within the epicardial surface of the heart. This is a uh, closer projection of the uh, epicardial hemorrhage. And then, like uh, pigs, you'll also see a vegetative valvular uh, endocarditis. Uh, when you see that in, in birds, you need to think of two other bacteria uh, that can cause that, uh, primarily staph, staphylococcus. Um, staph aureus is usually seen in, in, in my experience, since I uh, have seen more layers, I see that very commonly in layers. Uh, it'll also uh, see that with uh, multifocal necrotizing hepatitis. And then uh, E. coli or even a strep can cause that. E. coli would be the second most uh, common. But the three that you should think immediately are Cyplothrix, um, Staph aureus, and E. coli. Histologically in the liver, you'll see areas of uh, massive necrosis that are scattered throughout, and you'll also see bacterial colonies um, within that. Okay, so that's Erysipelothrix, or erysipelas. This is uh, another disease I haven't seen, so these are old slides also. Yes, did you have a question? Do you um, Usually not. Usually it's treated, if, is my experience. Most, here's the situation. That's, that disease is, is a couple of things. One is it's usually seen on range, so birds that are grown outside. And the tendency of the industry is to not uh, grow birds on, on, uh, on range. The other thing is uh, management in terms of removal of the snood. So it cuts away, it, it eliminates the pathogenesis of that swollen snood. They have a tendency to peck at that, and so they do that. But in my experience, no, I don't, I'm not aware that they vaccinate for erysipelothrix. It is treatable, uh, and flocks have been treated. Uh, this is a, another disease that, that I have not seen in turkeys. Uh, this is chlamydiosis. Chlamydiosis is um, a problem in pet birds, and I'm not going to discuss that, but I will talk about uh, that in, oops, in turkeys. Usually, the birds will be depressed. Their heads will be cyanotic. Uh, the classic presentation is a fibrinous pericarditis. This is the heart, and then uh, this just had covered with uh, fibrin, and uh, the pericardial sac is also affected. And uh, this is the pericardium that's been opened, and then this is the fibrin on the surface of the, of the heart. Uh, you see that in about 50% uh, of the uh, birds that are submitted. You'll have a splenomegaly. This is enlarged uh, spleen, and you'll see areas of uh, coagulative necrosis, which is probably through there, uh, with those organisms in there. Um, the liver is affected, however, more frequently, up to about 80% of the birds will have uh, necrotizing uh, hepatitis. It'll usually be uh, multifocal necrotizing. This is a photomicrograph of the liver uh, of a bird with uh, uh, chlamydiosis. Just to show you the pattern, uh, depending on the uh, toxigenicity or the, the toxic ability of chlamydia, it will depend on how it's going to present in terms of uh, distribution of necrosis within the liver. Highly toxigenic uh, chlamydia will cause a massive necrosis of the liver. Uh, and then other ones you'll see a, a piecemeal necrosis. Uh, this has a, a more piecemeal necrosis. And uh, as this is a higher magnification, just uh, hematoxyl and eosin stained, these are uh, degenerate hepatocytes. And they're filled with large numbers of uh, very small basophilic uh, elementary bodies, and those are usually about one micrometers in, uh, in diameter, and you usually have to take oil to be able to see them. Special stains, uh, however, uh, usually are required. Uh, those are usually uh, Machiavellos, which I use uh, quite commonly, and you can see there's a, a, a uh, eosinophilic or red uh, staining of those organisms. Uh, you can also use a Gimza, and they will stain a uh, dark uh, blue to purple through there. Uh, and then Yemenez is another stain. The background is green, and I, and I believe the, the organism is usually red for those. The other thing you need to think about in terms of chlamydiosis in birds, other than pet birds, I'll talk to, about pigeons. Uh, it's common to see that, and that usually presents as a conjunctivitis. Uh, so, uh, but you'll also see that in terms of flock problems. OK, so that's chlamydiosis. Anybody have any questions as I? Go along, feel free to ask. Is this a 
current disease in turkeys. We had an outbreak in a USDA inspected plant last year with a number of zoonotic mm -hmm. diseases resulting. Okay. I I don't doubt that. I know in Minnesota it's probably more of a problem, but in Indiana I have not seen any cases of chlamydiosis nor in Michigan. So and I this was in southeast region. Okay. Yeah. So it, it is a it is a current disease, it's just I've not seen it. Thank you for adding that. Um, this is Newcastle disease. Newcastle disease is caused by a paramyxovirus. It uh, presents in, uh, in multiple forms. Uh, the, the common terminology for this disease is called pneumoencephalitis. That's because uh, about 80% of the birds will show respiratory signs in terms of snicks and rails and, and, uh, and dyspnea. And then uh, about 30% will show uh, central nervous system signs. This is actually paralysis, where the bird is, uh, uh, has an extended neck. Uh, they uh, can sometimes they'll have torticollis. The other thing you need to think about is merics of the cranial nerves. They'll cause paralysis of the neck, uh, and they'll, uh, they'll act that way. It'll also cause a conjunctivitis with palpebral edema and uh, facial uh, edema, spatial swelling. This is, uh, I don't have any photographs of actual field cases of Newcastle disease. Usually, um, Newcastle will present in different terms of gross lesions. Depending on the strain of uh, the paramyxovirus, they are usually pathotyped in terms of a lentogenic, which is a very mild strain, a mesogenic, which is a, a more moderate strain, and then, as you all know, the velogenic strain, which is the highly pathogenic. That's usually done by, uh, in, by egg inoculation and the mean time in which the embryo dies. Uh, if the, the, the quicker it dies, the more pathogenic it is, or they also do intracerebral injection uh, to check to see uh, how hot this is. The, the photographs I'm gonna show you are actually of uh, velogenic, visotropic velogenic Newcastle or exotic Newcastle disease. The uh, lenogenic strain will uh, probably not have, they'll show respiratory signs or CNS signs, uh, but probably won't have any gross uh, lesions. Uh, I, w I had a case of mesogenic um, Newcastle in broilers, and the only gross lesions they uh, showed were um, a mild hyperemia to the trachea. Uh, so that's, that's kind of uh, about all that I saw. Oh, let me explain this. This is uh, the open esophagus, and there are multiple uh, ulcerations scattered throughout. Uh, this can also be avian influenza. Uh, it's very easy to uh, confuse the two. This is the opened uh, trachea. You can see that there's uh, hemorrhage and fibrin scattered throughout. This is a uh, fibrinonecrotic to hemorrhagic uh, tracheitis. With uh, hot diseases like uh, Newcastle disease, avian influenza, and duck viral enteritis, you can actually have Hemorrhage at the uh, proventricular ventricular junction, and uh, this is actual hemorrhage at the uh, esophagus and proventriculus. The uh, other area that's commonly affected is through here, but this is viscerotropic velogenic Newcastle disease. You'll see necrosis of the lymphoid aggregates within the intestine. These are the what are called cecal tonsils. The uh, cloaca is out here. The uh, small intestine comes in through here. These are the two ceca. And then right where the ceca enter into the uh, terminal ileum, there are these lymphoid aggregates of, of chickens. Those are called cecal tonsils. But you see hemorrhage of, of that uh, and necrosis within those um, aggregates. There will be petechiation of uh, breast muscles with viscerotropic velogenic Newcastle disease. And that's what this photograph illustrates. And then uh, brain lesions will uh, consist of a meningitis. This will help you differentiate uh, uh, Newcastle disease from avian encephalomyelitis, and uh, I believe avian influenza does not get uh, meningitis. The other thing you'll see with, and that was, sorry, this is a, this is a photograph of the meninges, and then uh, there are numerous infiltrates of lymphocytes scattered throughout the meninges. Uh, the other thing that you'll see, and this happens primarily uh, in the midbrain, is uh, paravascular cuffing of lymphocytes. You can also see uh, endothelial proliferation. I'll show you that on another uh, slide. There's uh, gliosis with uh, numerous small 
uh, nuclei uh, visible at this level. But you can see uh, the, the endothelial response through here where you get proliferation of the endothelium uh, and then uh, you can actually see some uh, cuffing. And the other thing you look for is uh, peripheral chromatolysis. These are some neurons uh, and the, the nucleus is eccentric and then you start to see loss of nissel substance. Uh, and so peripheral chromatolysis helps you uh, point you towards Newcastle disease, paramyx of virus infection. And this, those photographs were taken from the mesogenic uh, case that I, that I showed you, or I told you about. Okay. The next multisystemic disease I'm going to talk about is avian influenza. Um, avian influenza is commonly found in birds. Uh, we, I think the, probably the most common isolation right now is in ratites. Uh, there have been many different uh, uh, hemagglutination in neuraminidase uh, types. The classic fowl uh, plague is H7N1. That's the one that uh, kills many chickens. The one that happened, and this is, these are photographs taken from the Pennsylvania outbreak around 1984, was from H5N2. Not all H5N2s are uh, kill chickens. Uh, they, they vary in terms of, even though they have the same H uh, type, They'll vary in terms of pathogenicity. As a matter of fact, the H5N2 was recovered, I guess, uh, for, quite, for about a year approximately in the same area before it uh, reverted to extreme virulence and started killing off chickens. The, in terms of pathogenesis, the, the, the uh, orthomyxovirus has a tendency to attach to sialic acid uh, residues in the, uh, within the uh, epithelium of the trachea. And the, with certain cleavage of the uh, the uh, hemagglutination antigen uh, allows extreme pathogenicity. So it has to have that specific type to be able to become uh, highly pathogenic. This is a, uh, a layer operation, uh, not a very uh, good and probably a breeder uh, farm based on the way this looks, just piles of dead chickens. This is a uh, broiler flock with dead chickens scattered throughout uh, the farm to show you how devastating uh, this disease can be. Uh, avian influenza is uh, commonly uh, reservoired in waterfowl. As a matter of fact, uh, it's common to have isolate, isolation of avian influenza in Minnesota where they have a high water, a migratory waterfowl population uh, and that will spill over into some of the turkeys and usually won't cause this massive uh, die off or death. So uh, it can be a, a rather confusing disease but also be very devastating. The principal changes that we see with avian influenza is vascular, vascular related. Uh, this is the head of a chicken. This is a normal uh, comb on the left. On the right, it's very uh, dark blue and cyanotic. As a matter of fact, there's also some um, facial edema uh, due to uh, a vascular damage, both in the, the uh, comb and in within the uh, subcutis. There's another uh, lesion you can see is vesicles that are formed on the comb. Uh, and again, it's more of a vasculitis. As a matter of fact, histologically, if you look at this, uh, you'll see expansion of the, uh, the propria of the wattle by edema and, uh, and vascular necrosis. This is a, uh, the lower beak and tongue, and then this is the, the uh, larynx and trachea that shows uh, hemorrhage within the trachea. So this is a hemorrhagic tracheitis. Again, uh, this could be viscerotropic valgenic Newcastle disease and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You can also see caseous plugs uh, within the larynx or within the trachea uh, and hemorrhage. You get uh, some hemorrhage at the proventricular ventricular junction. Again, we saw that with Newcastle disease. And then histologically, this is a section of brain. You can see the vasculitis. You get vascular necrosis uh, and you can get uh, migration of inflammatory cells through the, uh, through the muscular walls. And so that's, that's primarily the, the encephalitis that forms with, um, with avian influenza. I think that's it for multisystemic diseases. Yeah, okay. Um, next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna vary from the schedule that you had for multisystemic diseases. That completes my portion of what we're gonna talk about, multisystemic diseases. And I think we'll change to respiratory um, diseases of chickens. Okay. 
Um, I wanted to briefly describe the normal anatomy. Sometimes, if you're not used to working with poultry uh, or birds, they, they do have a different uh, respiratory anatomy compared to what mammals have. Uh, they all have a trachea, as you well know. Um, the primary bronchus branches off from the trachea, and it goes all the way through the lung in poultry and commonly enters in the abdominal air sac. Birds uh, don't have a blind-in pouch that's responsible for oxygen exchange. Uh, it, in contrast to mammals, mammals have the alveoli. Uh, the, this is primarily an air holding and um, transport mechanism where the air flows in, it's held in here, and then it pushes back out through the lung. From the uh, primary bronchus, um, and birds, excuse me, birds have uh, eight, at least chickens have eight air sacs. They have a single cervical, a single clavicular, also called an interclavicular air sac. Then they have a cranial thoracic air sacs, which are two of those, two caudal thoracic air sacs, and then two abdominal air sacs. This is a uh, diagram, I believe Sturkey uh, drew, uh, did this. Uh, this is the primary bronchus that shows you as it enters in the lung, goes all the way, uh, passes all the way through, and then out into the uh, abdominal air sac. Off of those are secondary bronchi. That's also, there's also called mesobronchi. Um, I prefer the term secondary rather than uh, meso. And then parabronchi are these tubes that come off, which actually contain the, uh, the lung lobule, which is responsible for air. Uh, and that's uh, the tertiary bronchus, or it's also called a parabronchus. This is a normal airflow in birds. Uh, it, it varies on their evolution in terms of how sophisticated they are. Um, Usually, airflow is one way uh, throughout the system. This is a secondary bronchus as it comes off. Uh, it, the air comes in the trachea of the primary bronchus and the secondary bronchus, and then it goes down into the, the tertiary bronchus. The, the, uh, the air will also travel out into the air sac. Um, then as it uh, comes down the tertiary bronchus, it'll come back out into a secondary bronchus. The air from the air sac will also come out from the secondary bronchus and then up through the primary bronchus and it expelled. The lung lobule is the hexagonal uh, structure that is responsible for uh, oxygen exchange. The tertiary bronchus is in the center. They have numerous atria that, that out pouches um, that from the tertiary bronchus. It has an infundibulum that branches from that here labeled I. And then the air capillary and blood capillaries are, are intermingled and make up the majority of the lung lobule. This is a, uh, it, a uh, closer or a higher uh, view of that uh, drawing, or you can see the, the tertiary bronchus would be here, the atria would be here, the infundibulum, and then these little structures that come off are the air capillaries, and these co-join again and then come back out, uh, and then this is the, this is the, um, the blood capillaries. The air capillaries don't change in size, and the lungs do not inflate and collapse in birds uh, like they do in mammals. There's a, these are about uh, seven to 10 micrometers in width, and if they would expand and collapse, um, if they would collapse, they would never be able to open again, and that's why you don't get a, a change. These um, are, this area here, uh, close to the tertiary bronchus, will contain uh, macrophages within the lamina propria. You'll see those expand with, um, some granulomatous diseases, as a matter of fact, uh, it, mycobacteriosis, you'll see expansion of that population. You'll also see that with anthracosis or with birds that live in dusty environments. The lining, um, these are type one pneumocytes that line the atria. Those will become hypertrophied with many uh, viral diseases. I don't have a photograph of that. Uh, Chevelle did a good job in terms of uh, Newcastle disease and avian influenza where you can see necrosis and hypertrophy within uh, those cells. This is what it looks like on a photomicrograph, what you're used to looking at day in, day out. Again, uh, these are those hexagonal structures, the lung lobule. This is the tertiary bronchus. And then you can see some out pouch there, which is an atria. An infundibulum runs off through here. And then this mass is the mass of air capillaries and blood capillaries. Remember, um, these areas through here will become hypertrophied with viral diseases very uh, early on. Uh, and then the uh, macrophages right in this area will become expanded with, uh, with mycobacteriosis and uh, dusty environments. Okay, let's talk about the trachea. 
Um, birds have a uh, normal pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. This is the cilia. They have numerous alveolar mucus glands uh, that line the trachea. And then they have an elastic, uh, fibroelastic lamina propria. And then they have uh, cartilaginous, complete cartilaginous rings, unlike mammals where they have, uh, uh, this is complete in terms of circles. Uh, mammals will have a C form. And uh, those will also ossify very quickly, uh, at least in poultry. Uh, three to six months, they'll be ossified. So uh, you can see that happen very quickly. With response to disease, uh, you'll usually see de uh, deciliation, loss of cilia. And this next photograph shows that. You'll see loss of cilia. You'll see rounding and sloughing into the lumen uh, of the epithelial <coughs> cells. You'll also see the loss of the alveolar mucus glands uh, through here. And then this is expansion uh, by uh, edema, expansion of lamina propria. This is a bird that was exper experimentally infected with uh, infectious bronchitis, the coronavirus of chickens. And then uh, sometimes you'll see a luminal exudate of heterophils, uh, sleft epithelial cells, and macrophages. After the initial insult, when you see that change, you'll um, also see uh, sometimes loss of the epithelium. And then you'll see a spreading of that epithelium across the lamina propria. And this is in a, a stage of an attenuation. And you'll also see uh, loss of alveolar mucus glands. You'll see no alve alveolar mucus glands in there. During this time, you'll, you can see an infiltrate of uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells within the lamina propria. And then if the bird survives the uh, damage, the uh, trachea can then respond by becoming proliferated. And this shows a thickened <coughs> epithelium where you can see uh, hyperplasia of the epithelium. You start to see the, re the, the reformation of the alveolar mucus glands. And there's a massive infiltrate of uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells within that lamina propria. That'll happen in most viral diseases that birds um, can recover from. You can also see some of those changes with uh, high ammonia levels you know, within flocks. Uh, older, more mature uh, birds, such as uh, laying hens that have lived in a, a dusty environment. It's very common to see a large uh, lymphocytic infiltrate within the lamina propria. And I usually don't call that a, a lymphocytic um, tracheitis uh, because of the environment in which they live. I usually like to see a follicular change to be able to say that there's some disease going on or some other change. OK. So that's the general response of the, of the trachea. And I talked to you about the response of the lung. The air sac has, a, has another response. Um, it's usually lined by a, a single epithelial cell layer. Uh, it'll have a fine uh, fibrous connective tissue lamina propria. Uh, with acute damage, you'll see necrosis of those cells. You'll see edema of the lamina propria. And as it progresses, you'll see fibrosis. Uh, and then some lymphocytic infiltrate within the lamina propria of an air sac. So that's, that response is rather limited. This is infectious bronchitis. Uh, this is, again, one of those terrible slides that, that helps me to, to uh, remind me of what disease we're going to talk about. Infectious bronchitis primar primarily affects chickens. It'll affect all types of chickens. Um, it's seen in uh, broilers as uh, it'll cause air sac disease, uh, decrease uh, production parameters. And then you can see it also be a contributor to chronic respiratory disease that I talked about uh, with coli bacillosis. Um, in layer birds, you'll see uh, eggs that are uh, wrinkled, have a very wrinkled and irregular shell. Uh, you see that very commonly. There'll be a loss of egg production uh, somewhere around 20% that'll last about a week. Uh, the, not only will it affect the external eggshell quality, but it'll also affect internal eggshell quality. And you don't think about looking at lesions in eggs uh, if you're a pathologist, but if you, if you want to to uh, talk about infectious bronchitis, you need to do that. This is a normal egg on the left, uh, the normal yolk. These white areas are called, is called the chalazion. There's a thick albumin and a thin albumin, and this is in cross-section. You can see how the thick albumin stands up, and then the thin albumin kind of runs out. This is a bird that's been infected, or an egg that's been infected, uh, or taken from a bird that's infected with infectious bronchitis. You can see that there's a thinning of the thick albumin, a thick albumin here. And there's loss of that, so it runs throughout. Uh, so it does affect internal uh, egg quality as well. Uh, the, the lesions that, um, that you see with infectious bronchitis, uh, gross lesions are usually a hyperemia of the trachea. And uh, 
The diagnosis is usually based on virus isolation or a, a serologic response, not necessarily based on gross lesions or microscopic lesions. This is a disease uh, called infectious laryngotracheitis. It's caused by an alpha herpes virus uh, in poultry. The uh, typical presentation is what we call pump handle breathing. Uh, as a matter of fact, the bird, when it uh, inhales, will extend its neck, as this bird is doing, and it's open its mouth. And then as it exhales, that head will come down. And so you see this constant movement like this when the bird tries to, to breathe. Uh, since it's a herpes virus, it looks like infectious bovine rhinotracheitis of uh, mammals. It'll cause a uh, fibronotocrotic to hemorrhagic uh, laryngotracheitis. This is the open larynx here with mass of uh, fibrin within the opening. You can see there's a fibrin covering the lumen of the trachea. There's also areas of hemorrhage. Uh, sometimes you'll see a fibrin plug that will be right at the opening to the larynx. You see this with infectious laryngotracheitis, and in some cases I've seen that with uh, coli bacillosis, a massive exposure to E. coli uh, to birds. This shows an open uh, trachea with hemorrhage to show you that it can just uh, show, present as a hemorrhagic uh, tracheitis. Histologically, this is again a, a photomicrograph of the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium of the trachea. You're going to see um, intranuclear inclusions. This is, these are uh, epithelial cells. As a matter of fact, herpes viruses, in my experience, at least this one in uh, Pacheco's disease uh, in birds, has a tendency to form syncytia. So you see syncytia formation. There's a syncytia here. You see there's one down here. And then there's a nuclear margination of the chromatin. And then there's filling of the uh, nucleus with the eosinophilic inclusion. The, common uh, thing that you want to do, at least in field cases, in my experience has been sometimes where you go in and you'll see that it's past this stage. This is an early stage. A lot of the uh, epithelium will be sloughed and so that all you'll see is a naked lamina propria. And then in the center you'll see a mass of uh, fibrin, heterophils, um, sometimes bacterial colonies. And then you'll just see isolated syncytia sitting within that uh, luminal exudate. And so if you're trying to make that diagnosis based on histology, don't forget to look at the, the uh, lumen and the exudate because you can miss it if you don't look there. Okay. This is uh, infectious coryza, as, as Dr. Porter talked about. This is um, caused by Haemophilus perigallinarum. I have not seen a case of this. I guess it's common in the south and it's also common in California. Uh, it's seen primarily in layer uh, chickens. You'll see an infraorbital sinusitis. The, this is the closed eye here. This is the distension of the infraorbital sinus. If you open that up, you'll see that uh, there's mass of uh, fibrin and heterophils within that sinus. And this will, you can also see a, a facial cellulitis uh, associated with this. Um, other causes of facial cellulitis are pastorella multocida, as uh, Dr. Porter alluded to earlier. And I believe there's a, and a pastorella multocida type C reported in uh, turkeys is causing facial cellulitis. Okay. This is uh, a photograph of a young turkey poult. Uh, the term for this with the darkened around the eyes is called raccoon eyes. Um, the, this is uh, bordetellosis of turkeys or turkey um, it's uh, turkey rhinotracheitis, not to be confused with turkey viral rhinotracheitis, which is exotic to the United States. Um, that disease is caused by a pneumovirus. Uh, this one is caused by Bordetella avium. You'll see birds that uh, have a, a SNCC, which is, sounds just, which is a clinical sign that sounds like the word SNCC. Uh, you'll see a, an exudate on the, the uh, external nares. You'll see bubbles formed on the eyes. And then uh, with the epiphora, you'll see uh, ad adherence of dust and dirt around those eyes, and so that's why they look black. Uh, and that's why they're called uh, raccoon eyes. I like that term. The, the trachea will have a tendency to be flattened uh, and irregular. Uh, a normal trachea should have this appearance, but you can see there's flattening and folding. Um, I don't have a photomicrograph, but I have an EM. 
this um, bacteria likes to adhere to cilia. And so this is a uh, electron photomicrograph, or scanning electron photomicrograph of the bacteria. They're adhered to the cilia. Uh, histologically, you'll see lo loss of cilia. And then you'll see clumps of bacteria that are adhered to the cilia within the lumen. Uh, and then uh, I, I have not seen any changes in the cartilage uh, to be able to tell you what goes on there. So that's avian border pilosis. Okay. This is a um, chicken that's had its trachea opened, and you can see all these white gelatinous masses, uh, polypoid projections within the lumen. This is uh, wet pox or avian pox. Okay, um, Dr. Lynn will probably talk about this, so I, I'm not. I won't go heavy into uh, pox. And in uh, poultry, we have a tendency to talk about two forms of pox: dry pox and wet pox. Dry pox is anything that affects the skin. Wet pox is anything that affects mucous membranes. So wet pox can occur anywhere. Uh, you can see it within the mouth, within the trachea, uh, within the, the conjunctiva. And uh, the common viruses uh, are, that we see are avian pox and fowl pox viruses. Excuse me, fowl pox and turkey pox viruses. Uh, microscopically, this is, uh, those, this is a uh, photomicrograph of the section of trachea. You can see these polypoid masses uh, that project into the lumen. This is uh, the, that ossified uh, trachea, tracheal ring that I told you about earlier. Uh, at higher magnification, you can see that there are numerous intracytoplasmic uh, eosinophilic uh, inclusions of uh, pox virus. It's a pretty one, easy one to diagnose. So that's wet pox. This is uh, quail bronchitis. Quail bronchitis is caused by a type 1 adenovirus. The other type 1 adenovirus is inclusion body hepatitis. Um, and so the, this is an experimental case. Uh, usually you see death in young birds. This one's got a little bit of mucus plug within the trachea. Um, for comparison, this bird's head was probably about the size of a dime. So that tells you how small it was. And it's very difficult to, to tell grossly that you have a lesion. I was there when, when this bird was posted uh, during the experiment. Uh, microscopically, you can see that the, this is a photomicrograph of the uh, trachea. The lumen contains cellular debris. This is the uh, tracheal epithelium. And then there are these large uh, intracytoplasmic base, uh, basophilic uh, intranuclear inclusions of the adenovirus. So that's quail bronchitis. This is a pheasant, a hen, a mature hen pheasant. This is uh, called gape worm, syngomiasis is another term for it. That's the more, um, the scientific term. Syngomus trachea is the, uh, the nematode that causes this problem. Uh, this is a nematode parasite that lives within the trachea. This is an opened uh, trachea, and you can see these numerous uh, red nematodes. I've got another photograph that shows them a little bit better. Um, this one on uh, the uh, right, this is a male, uh, and then the female uh, surrounds uh, that male. The male stays attached uh, to the lumen, and then the female can sometimes leave the male and then go off uh, and feed some more and then attach to another male. The uh, mode of transmission can be direct or it can also be from an earthworm. Uh, birds, the reason it's called gape worm because of the, as the photograph showed you, that bird was, had a, a gaping mouth. The other thing that's described uh, in clinical signs, the birds will run along and they'll drag their mouth open along the ground because uh, that, that worm will irritate the, um, them and, and cause them to have difficulties in breathing. Okay. Um, just to be complete, this is a photograph that Dr. Porter, I believe, showed you earlier. This is a uh, fibrinous pleuritis, uh, and uh, this is fowl cholera, pastorella multacida. This is from a turkey. This is a uh, cross-section of uh, the lung to show you that uh, this is indeed a pleural pneumonia. The pleura, the pleura is infected, and then the pulmonary parenchyma beneath that is also filled with fibrin. Histologically, uh, the, it looks like a, a shipping fever in cattle where you see uh, large amounts of fibrin and, in this case, heterophils within the, 
tertiary bronchus. It'll also be within the atria. Uh, you can see massive numbers of heterophils that uh, infiltrate the air capillary region. And then you'll see expansion of the interstitium by edema, fibrin, and then heterophils. So it would look like a ship. This next disease um, is a disease caused by aspergillus. Uh, more commonly, fumigatus uh, has been uh, uh, speciated more, most frequently from uh, this, these occurrences. Uh, aspergillus can cause respiratory disease in young birds. This shows a, a young uh, chick that has open mouth breathing, a stiff snick. Uh, it can also cause problems in mature turkeys. Uh, you can see a colonization of the trachea and air sacs with that fungus. And uh, it's also seen commonly in pet birds. And one of the diseases that you ought to come up with for penguins is aspergillosis, okay? So if you have a penguin that dies, two diseases I immediately think of is malaria, uh, and the other one is uh, aspergillosis, okay? This is uh, the uh, thorax of a one-day-old chick. Uh, these are the lungs uh, that remain intact, and you can see these yellow uh, foci scattered throughout the pulmonary parenchyma. If you peel those over, you can see that they not only affect uh, the visceral surface, but it also affects the pleural surface. And if you did a cut section, you'd also see it affected that. Those are numerous granulomas uh, that are within the pulmonary parenchyma. This, the, the lay terminology for this disease is Bruder pneumonia. I'm sure you've all heard about that. Uh, Bruder pneumonia can, the pathogenesis is, uh, it can happen from when birds are in the setters or the, uh, are being incubated. If you have an uh, egg that's infected with Aspergillus spores, uh, those will grow and the egg will explode and release spores and infect uh, the other eggs. Uh, that can happen when birds are uh, in the uh, hatchers and they're, and they're about ready to be placed. Another place is uh, under brooders and why it has the term brooder pneumonia. Brooders uh, look like a metal pancake and they commonly have a heat source, primarily natural gas in this area. Some people use electric uh, that provides extra heat for the young uh, birds. It's also, uh, it's also very dark, and it's also moist, so it's a great place for uh, funguses to grow. And then, of course, you get spores and high concentration of spores, and then they're inhaled, and, and then you get this um, type of presentation. It can also uh, present as a mass, a uh, caseous mass within an air sac. This is an a adult turkey. Uh, this is the lung here, and this is the cranial thoracic air sac. Uh, and if you look at this mass, histologically, it'll be an eosinophilic uh, coagulum, and then you can uh, see fungal hyphae scattered throughout. Uh, this is, shows what uh, brooder pneumonia will look like. This is a, a uh, tertiary bronchus, and there's a, a mass of uh, eosinophilic mass within here. As a matter of fact, there's a rim of uh, heterophils that surround this area, trying to wall it off. If it goes uh, down to a later stage, you'll see uh, multinucleated giant cells uh, that uh, surround that mass. And if you use a silver stain, you'll see the common uh, presentation, aspergillus, uh, where you have uh, parallel walls, it'll be septate, and then you'll see dichotomously branched fungi to place it with an aspergillus uh, genus. You have to be able to grow it to be able to speciate it. This is a pet bird. Uh, in areas where there's high oxygen tension, you'll actually get formation of the fruiting bodies, and this is actually the, the black, uh, fuzzy appearance within this. Uh, this is the cranial thoracic air sac here. This is the caudal thoracic air sac. As a matter of fact, there's a yellow caseous mass uh, that also contained those fungi. So it depends on the presentation, um, where, where you'll actually get the fruiting bodies. Uh, and some of those uh, can even be severe. Uh, this is commonly found in geese. I mean, this, if I saw this presentation, I would think uh, this is probably a, a goose or a swan. Uh, they uh, have that nice uh, black appearance to the fruiting bodies. The thing that I always tell the students, you can diagnose uh, this as aspergillus. You can even speciate it if you do a tease prep, the necropsy table, and look at uh, fruiting bodies. The canida fours will allow you to speciate it. So that's aspergillosis. This is uh, infectious sinusitis of turkeys. This is part of uh, one of the diseases that's caused by Mycoplasma galliseptacum. 
The infraorbital sinus, as Dr. Porter and myself alluded to, is below and in front of the eye. Um, this is uh, distended. If you'd actually cut that open, you'd see this mucoid material that streams out uh, from that infected sinus. I get a lot of calls, usually about October, of I've got a turkey that's got swollen sinuses or it's big, got big cheeks. What's, the, what's going on? And that's from an infection of Mycoplasma galliceptica. Mycoplasma galliceptica can, can affect almost all birds. Uh, it's been uh, isolated from house finches uh, recently. The, um, this is from, I believe, a young uh, layer poult, since this is, I think, my photograph, and, and we have mostly layers, in, or had mostly layers in Indiana when I was here, and they still do. Um, but it presents in many different forms based on how long it, uh, it's been within that bird. This is uh, an air sac that has primarily bubbles. This is fibrin that's leaked, uh, and it's kind of like that frothy exudate you sometimes see in uh, the uh, trachea of cattle. Uh, where you get a, a whipping of that proteinaceous material and it becomes bubbly. If uh, allowed to go on further, then you'll get a follicular uh, air sacculitis, where you'll see a mu multiple miliary white uh, foci scattered throughout the air sacs. And that's just a simple, uncomplicated mycoplasma. Okay? Uh, again, this is a bad photograph of chronic respiratory disease that I told you about earlier, where you get a fibrinous polycerositis uh, with a uh, fibrinous pericarditis and a fibrinous a capsular serositis, and more than likely a fibrinous air sacculitis. Uh, microscopically, this is a uh, photo uh, micrograph of a section of trachea, again, the mineralized uh, and ossified cartilage rings. Here you get the lymphoid follicle formation, and you see massive polypoid masses um, or infiltrates within the, the uh, trachea. When I see that, uh, especially the lymphoid follicular formation, I think very highly of mycoplasma uh, infection in birds. Mycoplasma uh, galliceptacum likes the upper respiratory tract. It likes the sinuses. It likes the cranial uh, trachea. And uh, it will stay and, and colonize that uh, area and live very well. Uh, it can get into the air sacs. This is um, more than likely a secondary uh, bronchus. This is a, the tertiary bronchus. Uh, this is the secondary. And then you get polypoid masses of uh, lymphoid uh, proliferation within those uh, areas. Again, uh, you need to think about mycoplasma infection, not just mycoplasma galliceptacum, but other mycoplasmas can cause this. The thing you need to be careful about is the primary bronchus in uh, birds normally has a population of lymphoid aggregates. So uh, you see those commonly where the primary bronchus um, then uh, has outpouchings of the secondary bronchi. So at the junction of secondary bronchi and primary bronchus, you'll see bronchus-associated lymphoid tissue, or BALT, as some people call it. Um, this is a photomicrograph of the air sac that, um, grossly, it would have been that miliary air sacculitis. But here, as you can see, there's uh, lymphoid aggregates scattered throughout the lamina propria. And this lamina propria has uh, some expansion uh, by fibrous connective tissue. So this is a, a mycoplasma infection as well.